Welcome uh, once again to uh, our presentation on the tabernacles. This is the second in the series of the tabernacles, and today we are looking at uh, uh, the feasts and their application uh, part B. Yesterday we were looking at uh, the feast and the application part A. And uh, I really thank the Lord for what he's doing for us and uh, the information he would want us to share. And uh, I believe that uh, this series will be a blessing to all of us. And uh, I'd like us to pray as even we go into our second part of uh, the feast and the application, uh, the feast and the application. And so shall we uh, pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, thank you once again for the time that you give us that we may study your word. I do pray that uh, your presence may be with us and uh, the things that we need to learn, we may learn, and the things that we need to unlearn, we may unlearn. And so your angels may abide with us and uh, give us the gift of the Holy Spirit to be able to understand the spiritual things. In the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, amen. And so uh, I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad that uh, we can be able to share the word of God while there's still peace upon the earth for there are many areas in this world where you can share freely the word of God. And so if we have this opportunity of learning what is truth, I pray that we may use the opportunity to learn it. And um uh, 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 just uh, to remind us, in the first presentation, we were going through um, the sanctuary layout and uh, the apartments in the sanctuary and vessels in that sanctuary, uh, what could be found in that sanctuary and um, their application, what they meant, and how the sanctuary is a compacted prophecy of uh, the plan of redemption. And so basically that is what we went through uh, uh, part one, looking at the sanctuary outline, the vessels of the sanctuary and their application, and just trying to unpack it. And uh, today, as we enter into the feast and uh, the application part B, uh, we pray that uh, the Lord will be able to bless us with the spiritual understanding of uh, the heavenly things, and uh, we shall be able to learn what is truth. Now, um, when uh, you entered into the sanctuary, we had uh, we had uh, seven feasts. We had seven feasts in Leviticus chapter Leviticus chapter twenty three, and that is uh, where we left yesterday, the book of uh, Leviticus chapter twenty three, and that is where I want to continue with the, my presentation, the feast and their application. And so um, the big biblical feast days and uh, God's calendar, uh, the biblical feast and uh, the Lord's calendar. So I'd like to share my screen and uh, that we may be blessed together. Uh, the first day of the month, uh, Abi Bonisan was the first day of the Jewish um, religious uh, year. It will begin at the new moon of uh, our March and April and coincides with the latter rains. That is um, Joel chapter 2, verses um, uh, 23. Joel chapter 2, verses uh, uh, 23. Each month began with a new moon. You can check that in Numbers chapter 10, verses 10, and uh, Numbers chapter 28, verse 11, and 1 Samuel chapter 20, 
uh, verses um, 5. Psalms 81, verse 3. Isaiah 66, 23, Ezekiel 46, 3, Amos 8, 5, and Colossians 2, 16. The first day of uh, Tishri in the fall, customary begins the uh, new civil year. And so we had uh, in the Jewish uh, festival calendar what we call the, the religious year and uh, what we call the civil year. The, the civil year is what brought into view the 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 spring feasts and um, it was the beginning of um, the where we could call the religious year of the year of offerings and so And so it is more important to understand these things because they will help us when we are studying the book of uh, Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 9 in how we even calculate the years that Christ was upon the face of the earth, the face of um, the earth. And so when you come into the sanctuary, you had uh, seven feasts, as I have said. Had the seven feasts. But uh, before the seven feasts are given, uh, we find that there was the seventh day, that is the Sabbath of the Lord, the Shabbat. We understand from Genesis 2, 1 to 3, that uh, the Sabbath was the climax of God's work of creation uh, showing his power of, uh, he's showing his creative power. And then when he had finished it, he sanctified it and set it apart so that um, man may be looking at the Sabbath and uh, be in the Sabbath and understand that the Lord is our creator. All source of power comes from God himself. And so, um, we are told from Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3, it's a convocation day. No work is to be done in it. Not a feast day, not a moed, H4150, as it's not set by the new moon, but it's controlled by the sun. So it's not a moed, but it is um, a, a, a Sabbath set apart by a 24-hour clock, that is uh, uh, the sun. The fourth, com the fourth of the Ten Commandments, this is the only convocation day that occurs more than once a year. It was not a day that originated with the Jewish and the Ten Commandments at Sinai. It preceded them. The seventh day, that is the weekly Sabbath, is the sub Sabbath of the Lord. If you check uh, Leviticus 23, verse 3, a memorial to creation and uh, the creator established in Eden before the fall. Genesis 2, 1 to 3, because it began at creation before sin with no intrinsic animal sacrifices associated with it. It is a separate and distinct from the Sabbaths of the yearly sacrificial feast calendar of the temple. You, you can check that while you are reading Leviticus chapter 23, 37 to 38. It was not ordained for sacrifices, by the way, when it was given to humanity in the um, in, uh, in the Garden of Eden, the book of Genesis chapter 2, unlike the feasts which were given for sacrificial services. Um, and uh, those sacrificial services um, ended with Christ's crucif crucifixion, meaning that he was the anti-type meeting the type and were a shadow of type of some future event that will be their fulfillment or antitype. When one of the yearly Sabbaths fell on the seventh day Sabbath, it was referred to us as a high Sabbath day, and that is John 19, uh, 31. Uh, continued on, we find that um, in the sanctuary services, everything happened according to the plan. Everything happened to according to the sanctuary plan. There is no instance of um, uh, Jesus' life that uh, anything occurred in it not according to the sanctuary plan. Everything that happened in Jesus Christ's life happened according to the sanctuary plan because he was the embodiment of that temple. He was the architect 
of that uh, temple. And so everything that happened in it happened according to the sanctuary uh, sanctuary uh, plan. It happened according to the sanctuary plan. And so Jesus Christ, we are told that he is the Passover lamb. We, we, we try to deal with this uh, feast that were in the sanctuary. And um, um, the, the first feast was the feast of the Passover. Uh, we find that it was uh, on the 14th of uh, uh, the first month. And then uh, we had uh, uh, the feast of uh, the unleavened bread. And we had the feast of the first fruits. And we had uh, uh, the feast of weeks. And then we had the feast of the trumpets. We had the day of atonement. And then we had the Feast of the Tabernacles. And uh, we had what we call the Jubilee, as God willing, we shall be able to see about the years of Jubilees. And so um, Jesus Christ crucified as uh, our Passover lamb. Jesus Christ crucified as um, our Passover lamb. We find that uh, in Exodus chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. He shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and he shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the uh, evening. Now, let us try to unpack that. That um, This lamb was selected from the other uh, animals and uh, kept aside for some days before it was um, really uh, sacrificed. Jesus Christ did not come on earth and directly he went at uh, Calvary to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. When this lamb was separated from the other uh, flock, it was to examine it, to keep it separate from pollution and to examine if it were fit to be sacrificed for the solemn feast of the Passover. So when Christ came on the earth, he never went directly to the uh, courtyard or the, the altar of the burnt offering to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. But um, he, he was set aside. You find that after 12 years living with his parents, actually he retreated in the Garden of Gethsemane when he spent most of his days. And... Um, the father uh, was able to minister unto him and the angels and to prepare him for the great sacrifice. And he spent their time praying, meditating, keeping himself pure. And he was set apart. He says that, um, uh, you say of he whom the father has sanctified and said to the world that he blasphemeth. He was set apart and sent to the world. And so, as the lamb was set apart from the other flock to be examined and to be kept pure before sacrifice, so Christ never went directly to the courtyard, but he came and lived a life and proved that he is worthy to be the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. No man ever lived a blameless life on, the, uh, on, on this planet of earth. But when Christ came as a human being, he lived a pure life and uh, divinity combined with humanity, uh, uh, humanity being our example that um, uh, we can overcome sin in this fallen sinful flesh. Uh, he lived a perfect life and then him being a divine son of God was uh, enough to be offered as a sacrifice because a uh, human being could not be offered as sacrifices. If you offer uh, a human being as a sacrifice, we shall see that it cannot be accepted as uh, an atonement because that atonement uh, really covers the whole universe. That is the unfallen ones, and even it covers the angels who have never fallen. And so human sacrifice could not be accepted. And so Christ had to have these two natures so that uh, he may be able to atone for uh, sin. And so uh, that is an important point when I'll be talking about angels and the atoning sacrifice, I'll be able to go deeply into that. And so in the, 
evening, between the two evenings, the sacrifice could be offered, the Passover sacrifice. The Jewish divided the day into morning and evening. Till the sun passed the meridian, all was morning or forenoon. After that, all was afternoon or evening. That is between 3 p.m. of our day and 6 p.m. of our day, that was between the two evenings. From uh, morning until 3, you will find that uh, it was either morning or forenoon. But when it reached 3 p.m., that was the time for evening sacrifices, and they continued until 6 p.m., and they called it the two evenings. Their sixth hour was our noon. Their ninth hour answered to our three o'clock in the afternoon. By this, we may understand that the time in which Christ was crucified began at the third hour, that is at nine o'clock in the morning. And uh, you remember that um, the morning sacrifices were offered at uh, the ninth, um, uh, uh, at, um, at the ninth, uh, at the morning, that is at the third hour, that is what we call 9 a.m. At the third hour, that is 9 a.m. And um, the evening sacrifices could be offered at um, the ninth hour, which uh, really uh, corresponds with our 3 p.m. And so uh, we read that by this, we may understand the time in which Christ was crucified began at the third hour, that is at nine o'clock in the morning. The ordinary time for the daily morning sacrifice and added at the ninth hour, that is the three o'clock in the afternoon, the time of the evening sacrifice, is, as it is in the book of Mark, chapter 15, verse 25, verse 33, verse 34, and verse 37. Wherefore, their ninth hour was their hour of prayer when they used to go into the temple at the daily evening sacrifice. You can see that in the book of Acts, chapter 3, verse 1, where they went for the evening worship. Uh, or the evening sacrifice. And this was the ordinary time for the Passover. It was worthy of remark that God sets no particular hour for the killing of the Passover. Anytime between the two evenings, that is between 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., the sacrifice could be uh, offered. The sacrifice could be offered. And so um, it is worthy uh, to remark that. And then um, anytime between the two evenings, i.e. between uh, 12 o'clock in the day at the termination of twilight was lawful. The daily sacrifice in Exodus 29, 38 and 39 was killed at a half past eight, um, uh, half past the eighth hour. That is uh, half an hour before three in the afternoon. And it was offered up at half past the ninth hour. That is a half an hour after the three. In the evening of the Passover, it was killed at a half past the seventh hour and offered at a half past the eighth. That is half an hour before three. And in the evening of the Passover fell on the evening of the Sabbath. It was killed at a half past the sixth hour and offered at a half past seven. That is half an hour before uh, two in the afternoon. The reason of this was they were first obliged to kill the daily sacrifice and then to kill and roast the Paschal lamb and also to rest the evening before the Passover. Agreeably to this uh, Maimonides says the killing of the Passover is after midday, and if they kill it before, it's, it's not lawful, and they do not kill it till after the daily evening sacrifice and burning incense. And after they have trimmed the lambs, they begin to kill the Paschal lamb until the end of the day. Now, I, I know that is a whole lot of information. The issue is this, that um, when uh, Christ was offered as the Passover lamb. He also was being offered as a, a sacrifice that uh, would be able to work for the day of atonement. And so it behooved them to do a sacrifice that could cover the daily offering and the yearly offering in one sacrifice. We are told in Hebrews chapter 9 that he offered one sacrifice for all. He offered one, this man having offered uh, the sacrifice once and for all sat at the right hand uh, of um, his father. You can get that in the book of Hebrews. Uh, uh, in the book of Hebrews, um, is it uh, chapter 9? Yeah, 
he offered a sacrifice for once and for all. Uh, I'll check the verse and be able maybe to provide another time. And so, you know, why Jesus Christ had to act as a daily sacrifice and a sacrifice for the day of atonement is this, because uh, when people are born again, they do not go immediately into the most holy place. They pass through the sanctuary service. That is the courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. They have to go through the sanctuary, the plan of redemption. And so Jesus cannot come down once again to die at the altar of burnt offering for the people who are being converted on this day of atonement. So he offered that sacrifice once and for all. I have to look for that verse and uh, maybe somebody can shout it. Uh, having offered sacrifice once and for all. That is Hebrews chapter 10. Let me check it. 10 verse 12. I think, uh, I, think I have it. The book of uh, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12. We read that, uh, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, you can put it in your notes. And so I was saying that uh, it behooved him to die as a Passover lamb, and not only for that, but also to die for the day of atonement, to die for the daily and to die for the yearly, so that uh, if a person is born again today, Christ does not come down to die on the altar of burnt offering because the lambs were being given daily. But the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ covers that. And then for those who are in the day of atonement, Christ doesn't have again to be offered as the God uh, again for the sins of the world. He died on Calvary and the blood uh, he entered into the most holy place with was his own blood, which speaks of better things than the blood of the gods and uh, the lambs. And so the Passover happened in time and it fulfilled uh, that which was required uh, for the Passover lamb. Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, has died for us. It happened at the exact day, uh, the exact date, I mean. Uh, when he died, he was on uh, 14th of uh, the first month. The next, uh, in the, the next feast in the sanctuary was uh, the feast of the unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread. And uh, I want you to see this, the feast of uh, unleavened bread. Yes, uh, this used to happen on the 15th day of Nisan. And uh, Jesus Christ, after being offered as the Passover lamb, went to the grave without sin. That is, uh, he was unleavened bread. You remember Jesus Christ says in... Uh, uh, John chapter 6 verse 35 am um, the bread of life but then he was that bread without living so he was unleavened bread so living in instances actually means sin Jesus tells the disciples beware of the living of the Pharisees their hypocrisy their sin so Jesus Christ, who is the bread of life, must be unleavened bread. And um, if you want to know that Jesus Christ did not have sin, grave could not hold him down. Death could not hold him down. He burst forth from the grave because he was sinless. If he had any particle of sin, he could have not resurrected. He could have not been in that grave for an allotted time and then resurrected. 
he could have not been able to say, I lay down my life and I can take it up if he had seen. So Jesus Christ was our unleavened bread. The feast used to happen on the uh, 15th of Nisan, just the day after the Passover lamb was uh, sacrificed. And so Jesus Christ, our unleavened bread lay in the grave. It was the first day of the feast of the bread, 15th day of the first month, that is Abi the Nisan. You can check that in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 7, and Numbers chapter 28, verse 17. It was a convocation. It was a Sabbath day that uh, he lay in the grave, firstborn dedicated to the Lord's service in that day. And uh, travel to the sanctuary in Jerusalem required of all men to be in attendance of the feast of uh, unleavened bread. Exodus chapter 23, verse 14 and verse 17, and Exodus chapter 34, verses 22, and Deuteronomy 16, 16. Uh, these uh, feasts of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread really was a celebration of release from bondage in Egypt. You can check that in Exodus chapter 13, verse 6, 6 to 10. All leavened bread, hamitis, removed and placed by unleavened bread, the mazah. This day fell on the seventh day Sabbath, the day after the crucifixion, making it a high Sabbath, John chapter 19, that one we are told, and that day was a high Sabbath. Jesus spent the entire day in the tomb at rest on this Sabbath. It is, um, it is, uh, it is interesting that uh, Jesus Christ, while he was on earth alive, was able, as it was his custom, to keep the Sabbath holy. Even in his death, he kept the Sabbath holy because he lay in the grave undisturbed. The women who had anointed him waited until the Sabbath was over, and then they came with their perfume, they came with their ointments and uh, anointed his uh, body. So he rested in the tomb at the rest on this Sabbath. That is how much important the Sabbath is, that it should not be polluted with anything that uh, whatsoever circumstances, the Sabbath should be kept holy. If um, we do not keep the Sabbath holy, we are really unappreciating the restoration, the sanctification, and the recreative power of the Sabbath. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a type of the sinless nature of Jesus releasing us from the bondage of sin. If we have faith in his atoning death, Jesus is the sinless bread of life, John 6, 32 and 48, 41, 51. And leavened bread represented the corruption of sin in your life that Jesus overcomes, we are told in 1 Corinthians 5, 8. Putting away the sin in your life, that is leavened bread, hametis, and replacing it with it by accepting the sinless Jesus Christ and live and bread the mother in its place. It's the gospel message symbolized in the Passover meal known today as the Lord's Supper or communion. In fact, we are told that it's a higher cleansing. You participate in the Lord's Supper to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for you at the cross. We are told that in Luke 22, 19. This was the time of the year of the latter rain, March, April. On this day, Israel began to eat from the old corn and the manna ended the following day. You can read from Joshua 5, 11. Now, brothers and sisters, then we cannot, you know, when Christ was leaving the earth, before he died, he instituted the Lord's Supper or the Holy Communion. By the way, the, 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 the Lord's Supper or the Holy Communion is not an antitype of the unleavened bread. It was a new, um, a new, um, it was a new feast, I may say. It was a new uh, ordinance. That is the right word. This was a new ordinance that he gave unto them. It's not an antitype. The antitype to unleavened bread is Jesus Christ, a sinless person. So the ordinance of the Lord's Supper and the Holy Communion was given unto us to remember the feast of unleavened bread, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, a sinless person, to remind us that uh, also as he overcame sin, we can also overcome sin. We read in uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he who has begun a good work in you will accomplish it until the day of the Lord. 
So we cannot say that we cannot overcome sin because our example, Jesus Christ, our example was able to live a holy life and to show us the way. In fact, um, the book of First Peter, let me just uh, go through it very quickly. First Peter chapter 2, and um, I'm going to read from verses uh, 21 to 23 uh, from uh, my King James Version. Although when you read in other versions, it is also interesting. But I'll read from the King James Version. We are told, First Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 25. Talking about this unleavened bread, Jesus Christ being our example, the Bible records through inspiration. For even here unto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judged righteously, who his own self bear our sins in his own body, that is the sinless body. Yes, there will be, uh, we are recording and it will be uploaded on YouTube, so you will be able to watch it. Thank you so much. So. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Who, his own self, bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For ye were a sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. And so now we are told, um, let us celebrate the feast. Uh, let us celebrate the feast uh, without uh, the living. The book of First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. First Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. The Bible says, Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old living, neither with the living of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And uh, I really love that. It really uh, points out very well the unleavened bread, what it means. We can reread it again, 1 Corinthians 5, 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with all living, neither with the living of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread. So unleavened bread does not have malice and it does not have wickedness, but it has sincerity and it has the truth. And that is what actually the unleavened bread signifies. And Christ met the antitype of unleavened bread because he did not have wickedness and he did not have malice, but he was the spirit of truth, the spirit of uh, uh, righteousness. And so uh, the feast itself was uh, really uh, accomplished on the day and on the date. And then uh, we had uh, the feast of, uh, let me see, after the feast, after the feast of the unleavened bread, we had what we call the first fruits. Now it's interesting uh, when we talk about uh, the first fruits, the first fruits, and let me see what uh, we can glean from that. I'll share my screen again. The feast of uh, the first fruits. This happened on the 16th day of the first month, that is Nisan. Now, on that day, what we call the first fruit was uh, when we do planting, that which is the first uh, uh, plants to mature, uh, they were to be brought before the priest and waved before him. 
That was what they call the first fruit. You can check that in Exodus chapter 34, verses 25 and 26, and Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10 to 14, and then uh, Numbers chapter 9, verse 10 to 11. It was not a convocation day, no restriction on survival work. It was a time for barley harvest. And uh, the first of those corns, uh, the first of those uh, barley harvest, uh, of those fruits um, uh, were, uh, were brought before the priest and waved before the priest. And that is, uh, you can check Leviticus chapter 23, verses 10 to 11. This was the day of uh, the first sheep waving type, the first fruit of the barley harvest. The antitype was Resurrection Sunday, which also occurred on 16 Abib Nisan. Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. You can check that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 and 23, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, 6 to 8, the antitype. At his resurrection, Jesus also resurrected the saints whose tombs were open at the moment of his death, Matthew chapter 27, verse 52 to 53, as a type of the resurrection at the second coming. These saints were presented to the Father for his approval by Jesus in heaven, John chapter 20, verse 17. At the moment, the barley sheaf was symbolically waved at the temple at the time of the morning sacrifice, that is the third hour, 9 a.m. Now, this, this gets so interesting. Before I continue with that slide, they brought the, the barley harvest, that is the sheaf, the, the, the sheaf of the wave or the sheaf wave, and it was waved before the priest. Now, in that barley, we have two things. We have the wave sheaf, the barley itself, and from the flour that came from that barley, we had what we call the breads of the barley. So we had two things on the day of waving the wave sheaf. And uh, Jesus Christ himself is the wave sheaf. Now the priests, the priest accepted the wave sheaf from the people. And then now, uh, he waved it before the Lord. Jesus, when he resurrected that morning, he told Mary, do not hold on to me because I have not ascended before uh, the Father. I have to go first, the sacrifice or the wave shift be accepted. Then uh, if it's accepted, I can come back and then uh, uh, give more instruction. Uh, I'm trying to get into the mind of Jesus Christ what he's telling Mary, that uh, he has to go to the Father let him not delay him. Why should not Mary actually delay Jesus Christ? Because we are told that the wave shift was offered at 9 a.m. And Jesus Christ had to appear before the Father that resurrection morning at 9 a.m. when the wave shift was to be presented. And so he had to ascend to the Father to be offered as a wave shift or to offer himself as a wave shift. And then uh, when the Father had accepted him, how do I know that the father had accepted him at that morning? He came back here on earth in uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 18, and said that uh, all power and authority has been given to me. Who had usurped it? Satan had usurped it when uh, Adam and Eve fell into sin. And so they relinquished the kingship of this earth. But when Christ died for this earth, he got that power again from his father. And so he came back. So he went as a wave ship was accepted. But I told you, uh, the wave ship was presented and the flour from it was able to make what we call the wave, uh, the breads, the, uh, the breads of the wave. And um, those waves, th those breads now were the tokens of uh, the first, uh, of the first fruits. And so Jesus Christ, after he had presented himself before the father, he came back to earth, and after 50 days, he was able to go with those who resurrected. Uh, I, I really request that uh, we mute ourselves. So uh, when uh, after 50 days on the on the on the on the on the feast of um, on the feast of the, the weeks, that is the Pentecost, he went with the, the, those who had resurrected, and those are the trophies or the breads from the first fruit. That is the bread 
of the wave shift. So the work of Jesus Christ, who's a wave shift, had to be presented before the Father and those who resurrected when um, he died uh, and the tombs burst forth, went with him after 50 days to be as the tokens of uh, the fruits of the first fruit. And so it happened on time and everything uh, really was according to the time. And so continuing with this slide, um, continuing with this uh, slide of uh, the day of the first fruit. It is important to note that it was not a day of convocation, not a Sabbath to the Jews. So there is no reason for it to be a Sabbath in Antitype, post-resurrection to Christians. You know, people say that because Christ resurrected on Sunday, then that is uh, uh, the day of uh, our worship. But uh, this was not to be an Antitype Sabbath. Uh, so there is no reason for it to be a Sabbath or in Antitype post-resurrection to Christians. This is because the yearly festivals were not just commemorative in nature, but also prophetic, pointing to future holy events as fulfillments. To suggest a new Sunday holiday was instituted on Resurrection Day is to say the yearly festival calendar appointed by God was in error, since it omits a weekly first day observance. In Jewish tradition, the period called the Oma begins on 16 Nisan and extends for the count of 50 days to Pentecost or Shavuot. Mana ceases to fall on this day in Joshua chapter 5, verse 12. And so the wave offering was an offering made by the Jewish priest in token of the solemn special presentation to God. And uh, you can check in Exodus 29, 24, verse 26, verse 27, and then you can read the whole of uh, uh, Leviticus 7, Leviticus chapter 8, Leviticus chapter 9, and Leviticus chapter 10. The sheaf or the omer or the wave offering then became the property of uh, the priest. And so everything happened on time. And um, after that, we had uh, another feast. We are looking at the feast of the sanctuary, their antitype, and what they mean to us. Now, it is uh, refreshing to know that uh, Jesus Christ became our first fruit meaning that uh, those who overcome also will be able to resurrect. And so it is also another teaching that um, uh, we do not go directly to heaven after we die, but uh, we are buried and await resurrection. And so just as Christ went to the grave and resurrected, so if we die today, if we sleep and we are sinless, we shall never remain in the grave, but uh, we shall rise again. And uh, uh, the Lord reminds me of a verse in First Corinthians chapter 15, which is beautiful, and uh, it summarizes this one better. Um, First Corinthians chapter 15, from verse 17. First Corinthians chapter 15, Verse 17, it says, and if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. So it means because Jesus Christ was raised, we are not in our sins. We who accept Jesus Christ as our first fruit and as our Passover lamb, as unleavened bread. If he resurrected, then we are not still in our sins. A provision has made us to be sinless. By him being first fruit, it gives us the power to be sinless. So we don't have to wait until the second coming of Jesus Christ to be sinless. By the virtue that he resurrected as a first fruit, then verse 17 says that we can attain sinlessness. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished, if we say that Christ has not risen. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep, which means he has become the resurrection of them that sleep, slept. Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. 
For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Praise the Lord. And so um, our only hope is not to be on this world and remain on this world. We have a hope that because we have a first fruit, also we shall be able to resurrect from the dead. The next feast was the feast um, the feast of uh, the feast of Pentecost or the feast of the weeks. And uh, let us look at this now. We are going through the feast and their importance. That is uh, part two. And uh, I like to share again my screen. And uh, before I just continue, I want to say this, that uh, there is nothing more beautiful than studying the, the sanctuary message. Really, it, um, it demolishes all the doubts, all the fears that we have in our lives. It removes that uh, anxiety and uh, uncertainty of what the future beholds. Because as we go through these steps in the sanctuary, uh, the ultimate goal or um, the, the ultimate product is man being restored in the glory of God, in the likeness of his maker, in the image of God who created him. That is how beautiful the sanctuary portrays the life of a human being who happened to fall in sin, but Christ, uh, from the love that he had for us, gave himself and the Father, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him might not perish but have everlasting life. That is the beauty of the sanctuary. There is no other place you learn these things, you learn them in the sanctuary. And uh, uh, Christ has given us the second probation so that we may not perish. So the Feast of the Pentecost, the Shavuot, fulfilled antitypically 50 days after the first fruit or the Christ's resurrection and 10 days after his ascension on 7, 6, when the Holy Ghost was poured out upon the believers in Acts chapter 2. You can find that in Exodus chapter 34, Leviticus chapter 23, and then Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 20 and 1 Corinthians chapter 16. As I said, it occurs 50 days after the day of the first fruits, after the Balish sheep waving on or about the sixth day of the third month of uh, Sivan. That is the third month is Sivan. It was a convocation, a Sabbath day, no survival work to be done. Travel to the sanctuary in Jerusalem required of all men in Exodus chapter 23 and Exodus chapter 34 and Deuteronomy chapter 16. It was a time of uh, wheat harvest first fruits presented to the Lord, Leviticus 23. And so um, there's a, a remarkable point that you should get from uh, the Feast of Pentecost. I'd like to say this, and uh, I believe this is the truth. Jesus Christ, knowing the sanctuary so well, told the disciples, wait for me in Jerusalem that you may be endowed with power and you may be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria and all other parts of the world. Now we were told that it is a holy convocation. It a, was a day of assembling together. In the book of Acts chapter two, we are told when that day arrived, Acts chapter 2, you can just rush there with your Bible. Um, we are repeating these things. Repetition makes impression and uh, it uh, makes us bold. It makes us strong in the things that we believe in. Acts chapter 2, we read verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. That was what was repeated required of in the day of the Feast of Weeks, or what you call the day of Pentecost. And in that day, during the wheat harvest, the priest actually blessed the people. 
Now, Christ, while he was in heaven as a priest, how could he bless his people who are on earth? It was by the outpouring of the former rain to signify his acceptance as the first fruit, to signify the acceptance of those he took to heaven as the breads of the wave ship that had been accepted and to fulfill the feast of the first week. And so there was no earthly sanctuary. Uh, Christ had uh, made the curtain that separated the holy place and the most holy place to be torn from uh, bottom to up or from top to bottom. And then he was uh, our priest in heaven. And so to bless his people on earth, he poured forth his Holy Spirit as a blessing. Now, there is no greater blessing that we can have than the blessing of the Holy Spirit because it brings about the physical healing and also it brings about the spiritual blessing. It endows us with the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 and it also endows us with the gift of the Holy Spirit in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to be co-workers with Christ in his vineyard. But another aspect of uh, the blessing of the Holy Spirit is this, the division of Psalms 133. Psalms 133. <clears throat> this is another great blessing of uh, the, the blessing of the Holy Spirit. We read in the division of Psalms 133, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard. Aaron was the high priest. Now Christ has become our priest and high priest that went down to the skirts of his garment. So as it flows from the beard from up in heaven, it flows unto his skirts, which is the earth. We are told the throne of God is in heaven, but the earth is his footstool. And so you expect his cards to be on earth. I'm trying to bring that uh, figurative language more uh, um, uh, uh, real in uh, this passage. As the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded what? The blessing, even life evermore. So the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost or on the Feast of Weeks was an anti-type, the fulfillment of uh, what was the Feast of the First Fruit uh, of the, uh, the Feast of the Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost in the Old Testament. And because the priest gave a blessing unto the people, Christ says that he has given his oil, his uh, ointment to us as a blessing, and that is his spirit. If you can take everything away, but if you give the Holy Spirit to the people of God, then they'll be having everything because this blessing of uh, the ointment or the oil that runs from the beard to the skin, we are told this blessing is life evermore. So what Christ was giving on the day of Pentecost to the disciples was life. And we can uh, really enjoy the benefits of the feast of weeks or Pentecost by accepting the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, I want to bring your attention to two verses before we go to another feast, uh, knowing that the time is running so fast. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verses 33. We are told in Acts. Chapter 2, verse 33. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the promise of, of the Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. So, after Christ receiving of the promise of the Father, he shed to his disciples. But why did he shed it to his disciples? The book of Titus. Chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. The book of Titus. 
the book of Titus. Uh, Titus, it's a small book, chapter three, and uh, I'm looking at uh, verse five and verse six. Why did Jesus Christ share the promise of the Father to the disciples? Not by works of righteousness which you have done, but according to his mercy has saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So he was not only fulfilling of the Feast of the Weeks or Pentecost, but he was shedding on the disciples his own righteousness. Our works are filthy uh, rugs, and it's only the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is acceptable before the Father. And so for us to be accepted before the Father, we must have the righteousness of the Father. And since the righteousness of the Father is in the Son, then it behooves the Son to give us that righteousness to be accepted before the Father. Not because the Father is angry with us, but because Satan has taken something from the Father. And the Father, with a longing desire, he seeks a way so that uh, we may be reconciled to him. He may take away the power of Satan from us. He sheds that righteousness through the Son to us. And so we are privileged again after Satan plunging us into sin, again to be reconciled to our heavenly Father into his own likeness by being given his spirit, and that is being given his righteousness through his Son. Praise the Lord. And so the next feast in the sanctuary was um, the feast um, of uh, the trumpet. After the feast of uh, after the feast of um, the weeks, we had the feast of the trumpet number five. Two more to go. And so, again, this one happened, um, that is uh, on the first day of the seventh month, that is Ethanim, that is Tishri. You can check that in Leviticus chapter 23 and 24 and Numbers 29. Uh, you find that uh, the first four feasts are what we call the spring feasts. They were fulfilled in the spring, that is, in the beginning of the religious year. And then we have what we call the fall feasts, which are fulfilled when we are coming to the end of the religious year. And we understand that uh, we have the feasts that were in the, in the, in the courtyard and the holy place and the feasts that covered through the most holy place. Now, we don't expect the feasts of uh, the trumpets to happen in the courtyard or in the beginning of the work in the holy place, but we expect the feast of the trumpet to happen at the end of the work in the holy place in the beginning of the work in the most holy place because they followed each other very nearly with the, the feast of uh, the day of atonement. And so there was a great gap between the feast of the weeks, that is the Pentecost and the feast of the trumpets. There was a gap uh, between when the spring feasts were ended and when the fall feast began. And so fulfilled in the Millerite Great Advent Movement worldwide from 1833 to 1843, that is 10 days or 10 years, announcing the heavenly judgment, the antitypical Yom Kippur, which commenced in 1844 at the close of 2300 days, years of Daniel 8.14, to cleanse, vindicate, make right, restore God's heavenly sanctuary, Hebrews 9.23. Yeah, this was an announcement of 
to Israel of impending judgment, which occurred on the Day of Atonement nine days later. The anti-type of trumpets was the worldwide proclamation of the second coming in 1843 during the Great Awakening revival, which was based on the 2300 days year prophecy prophecy in Daniel 8.14, which began in 457 BC and ended in 1844. And uh, the feast of the trumpets were to bring an alarm to the people who were around the camp that uh, in 10 days, judgment was beginning. So put your house in order. Now we, we, we shall find uh, as we go through this um, feast that um, because it was an alarm, it, because it was a warning, we shall find that uh, these are warnings that tells us about judgment beginning and judgment coming to an end. And so we are looking at the signs of the time. What time are we living on the face of the earth? You can check out your book, Matthew chapter 24, and even check the book of Revelation chapter 13. You check out Daniel chapter 11, and you understand that uh, the time that you are living in a solemnly time. God is telling each one of us, keep your houses in order for judgment is going on and judgment is about to be finished. So this is what coincided with the, the midnight cry of the first announcing of the midnight cry in, um, in uh, Matthew chapter 25. It is interesting as we go through Matthew chapter 25 and the feast of the trumpets or the warnings and the alarms to announce the judgment hour, you find that um, talents are being bestowed upon those who are becoming wise virgins. The foolish virgins are left with their lamps without oil, without preparation for the coming of the bridegroom. But those who are wise have that extra oil. They are given talents and they are using them for the glory of God. The house has to be kept in order. Everything that must be done must be done so that when your name is called upon on the day of atonement, you'll be found not wanting in the balances of the sanctuary. And so it was a, a very solemn feast that uh, prepared the Israelites for the priest uh, entering into the most holy place and the high priest now, uh, I, I mean the high priest entering into the most holy place and it was a warning. You find that it was not only the trumpet that was blown, on that day to prepare a people for the high priest to enter into the most holy place. When uh, the high priest was finishing his work, there was a bells of pomegranates on the hem of his garment, which also sounded an alarm when he was coming from the most holy place. So you find that the people were in the camp before the day of atonement, they had the trumpet blowing. And they knew that, oh, this is a time to get ready. All living has to come out of our houses. If there is anything that will make me not be accepted on the day of atonement, by the grace of God, it has to come out. And when the high priest was just about to finish the work, you could hear the bells of pomegranates on the hem of his garment as he moved step by step coming from the most holy place. It could be heard in the camp by the people there. And so now we have a high priest who has gone into heaven. Those who proclaimed the midnight cry were the ones proclaiming the trumpets that Christ was entering into the most holy place and everything that has to be made ready has to be made ready. When he comes out, we shall hear the bells of pomegranates on the hem of his garment, which are the signs of the time. And they will alert us this issue is over we can hear the footsteps of a high priest coming from the most holy place as I speak right now. When you look at the events that are portrayed in the book of Matthew chapter 24, Daniel chapter two, Daniel chapter 11, Revelation chapter 13, you can be sure that time is no longer. 
we are here, but for a brief time. Just uh, to bring to an end this with the last uh, two feasts and um, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. We shall be having a detailed study on this, uh, on uh, the Day of Atonement, but allow me just to pass through it um, uh, as we lay the foundation for the sanctuary message. The Day of Atonement happened once in a year. It happened once in a year. And uh, there's a reason that it happened once in a year. During the year, we had what we call um, the daily sacrifices, where you could sin, repent, sin, repent, come out of the sanctuary and go inside the sanctuary. But on the day of atonement, there was nothing like sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting, going into the sanctuary and going out. You either entered into the sanctuary in the most holy place and abode there, that means that you follow the Lamb whatsoever he go, or you are cut off from Israel. We, were, we, we are told in Leviticus chapter 23 that those who did not appear as they should before the sanctuary on the day of atonement, they were cut off from Israel. And so brothers and sisters, it's a dangerous thing to be sinning and repenting. That is going out of the sanctuary and coming in. We will end up like five foolish virgins who went out when they came, the door had closed. Try to think about this. If you sin and the door of probation has been closed on you or on the whole church, who will accept your sin to mediate for them? Who will receive your sins in the sanctuary? None, and you will be able to bear your sins. So this issue of uh, getting into the sanctuary and uh, going out, getting in and going out, sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting, it is an abomination to God. It means that um, we are accepting a profession of uh, religion and denying the power therein, professing godliness, but uh, denying the power they are in. The daily services accepted you to sin and repent. And I'm talking about willful planned sinning. For Hebrews 10, 26 says that uh, if anyone sins willfully, there remains no sacrifice for that person. And so if we know this is sin and plan to do it, we don't... Uh, ask God to give us the power to be able to remain sinless upon non-sin, we are uh, really grieving the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, I'll be reading something in uh, Hebrews chapter 6 just uh, in a minute. So the yearly services were to point out that all the sins of Israel had been confessed and then the, now the high priest was ready to put them on the scapegoat, the originator of all sin. In the division of Psalms chapter 7, division of Psalms, uh, chapter 7, verses 16. The division of Psalm 716, his mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own pet. It was on the day of atonement that all that had been transferred to the high priest was now put on the scapegoat. You can check that in Leviticus 16, 21. Let us go to Leviticus 16, 21. Leviticus 16, 21. Uh, we are told, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live of the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions in all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. So the day of atonement was not a day of sinning. It was a day of transferring sin. But uh, it is amazing that uh, we continue to willfully sin and expect that uh, our sins will be atoned for. 
it is uh, something so solemn. It's not a time for sinning. I, I told you I'll read the book of Hebrews chapter 6 to close up the day of atonement or uh, uh, just to shed light on it. Hebrews chapter 6. The book of Hebrews chapter 6. And remember, we are just laying foundation. We shall go into deep waters as we explore this issue of the sanctuary. I love the sanctuary message. It is the one that gave Seventh-day Adventism life, and it is the only message that will keep this church alive. These many things that we are running into will never keep the church alive. The reason why you see a lot of dissension, the reason why you see a lot of uh, ministries which cannot unite, it is because the people have stopped studying the sanctuary. If we will put our heads together and study the sanctuary, then all these discordant views of all other doctrines will fall into place because we shall be partaking of the spirit of Christ. And if the spirit of Christ is in you and the spirit of Christ is in me, we shall have harmony. But because we are not drinking from the fountain of life, which is the sanctuary, that is why we are having this discordant uh, 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 opinions and we are not able to unite as we were told in John chapter 17. And so we are told this, on this day of atonement, what are we being told? Hebrews chapter 6. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is the doctrine of the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. That is a doctrine in the courtyard. Let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Of the doctrine of baptism, that is the uh, courtyard, and laying on of hands, courtyard, and of the resurrection of the dead, that is the courtyard, and of eternal judgment, which actually it is in the courtyard by the burning of the ashes, and then uh, on the table of the shoe bread, where actually the statute books pronounce judgment upon the wicked. And that is the, the book, the table of shoe bread, which is the word of life in there in the holy place. He says, let us leave these things, Verse 3, and this we will do if God permit. Then if we live these things, courtyard and holy place life as a people, where should we go? Verse 5, verse 4 says, for it is um, impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, <clears throat> seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So when you have tasted the power of the Holy Ghost, that is the lampstand, uh, which have the oil, and then gone to perfection in the most holy place where it, there is uh, uh, our God who is perfect, if you go back into sin, then you are crucifying the Son of God once again, which means you are leaving the most holy place and going to the courtyard because that is where Christ was crucified. And so it is a public shame for somebody to reach into the most holy place and then drift back into the courtyard. It means that they are still clinging unto some things which they had left. And we are told this is like a pig wallowing back into the mud or his uh, uh, dirt again. And uh, may the Lord help me, may the Lord help you so that uh, we may leave this habit of uh, going from the most holy place into the courtyard once again to crucify Jesus Christ. All known sins. When Jesus says that, son, I have forgiven you your sins, go and sin no more. He means it. He means that he has given us victory over all known sin in the courtyard and in the holy place. And now we move unto perfection into the most holy place because we are in the day of uh, atonement. And so we are told that uh, we should go unto perfection. Then the last thing, the very last thing was... Uh, 
the feast of uh, the tabernacles. The last feast was um, the feast of uh, the tabernacles. And so, just a couple of points as we close. It was a homecoming or the second advent. It followed after the feast of the day of atonement. It was separated by five days. This happened on the 15th day of the seventh month. That is the ethanim or Tishri. You can look in Exodus 34, Leviticus 23, and Leviticus 39, Leviticus 23, and Numbers chapter 29. It was a convocation, a Sabbath day. No survival work was done. Traveling, travel to the sanctuary in Jerusalem required of all men. And so we find that uh, uh, the people who had passed the day of atonement celebrated the Feast of the Tabernacles. And if uh, we understand that uh, if we pass the day of atonement and uh, we are blessed to have victory over sin, then the next thing is to celebrate um, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles with Jesus Christ, that is at his second coming, the book of uh, Revelation chapter 9, the book of the book of Revelation chapter 7, not chapter 9, verse 7, chapter 7, verse uh, 9, chapter 7, verse 9, Revelation, it says, after this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude with which no man could number of all nations and kindred and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And so you find that uh, on that day, they celebrated the Feast of the, the Tabernacles with palms in their hands as a sign of victory. Um, for seven days, all Israel moved out of their homes and lived in temporary shelters called the Socha as a reminder of their or Sukha, as the reminder of their wandering in the desert for 40 years. So after being on this earth for all these years, we shall celebrate, uh, uh, we shall go to a honeymoon of a thousand years in heaven just to celebrate our miseries uh, and forget about the miseries that we had uh, uh, on this earth. The branches cut from the palm, Revelation 7, 9, willow and other trees were to be waved in celebration to the Lord during the first seven days of the feast. And you understand that, uh, we shall be in heaven. The final feast of the year is a celebration of in gathering at the end of the harvest. That is Exodus 23, 16. And as is a time of rejoicing and fellowship, it symbolizes the gathering of harvest of God's people who live out for the week-long marriage supper of the Lamb to be celebrated at the Father's house in heaven after the second coming of Jesus in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 to 9. This begins the millennium where the saints will dwell temporarily until the earth is made new after the judgment of the wicked in Revelation chapter 20. And so we are at the threshold of the Feast of the Tabernacles. Soon and very soon, no one knows how soon Christ shall be revealed in the clouds of the air. What is my parting shot on this issue? Acts chapter 3. This is my parting note to all of us, me included. If we will be ascended in heaven, we must be ascended on earth. Acts chapter 3, verses 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. And when the times of refreshing shall come from uh, the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. It is my prayer that um, the Lord may find a faithful church. You included, me included that he may bless us. And we are told in Hebrews chapter nine, verse 14, how much more uh, that Christ offered himself without spot through the eternal spirit. And how much more he will purge your conscience from dead works that you may serve the living God. This is what the Lord is doing and preparing a people who will live in harmony in heaven. Nahum 1, 9 says that, uh, Whatever you have thought of the Lord, he shall bring it to an end. Sin shall rise not anymore. Sin shall not be there. And so if sin shall not be there again, then it must end here. There is no other world that we are going to overcome sin in. It is only this earth that we are going to overcome sin with. God has provided everything for us. He has provided his Holy Spirit. And it only awaits our reception 
And when we receive it, then the seed of Jesus Christ remains in us and we cannot sin anymore. Then Christ shall come and take us as his own. Christ is waiting with a longing manifestation of himself in his church. When his character is reproduced among his people, he shall come to claim them as his own. May the Lord bless us as we go through this uh, sanctuary service that uh, we will not have just information, but uh, our minds, as we get these themes, we shall be converted. Lastly, your word have I kept in my heart that I may not sin against the Psalms, the division, uh, 119 verse 11. Let us keep the word of God in our heart. Let us be a people who constantly are, uh, are longing to be in the presence of God so that we may learn of him and be able to walk as even Christ himself walked on this earth. And so may the Lord bless us and uh, may the Lord continue keeping us and uh, we can just uh, end this with uh, a word of prayer. Let us uh, humble ourselves even as we pray. Abba Father, we know that uh, the table is about to be set for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Not uh, for the fear of being lost, not for the joy of being saved, Lord, but for the love of what you have done for us, help us to be at your service. And so thank you, and thank you for your children as they contemplate these things. Lord, as I think of these things, may I continue beholding Jesus Christ and be turned from glory to glory. Even as the church continue doing this, may we continue looking like Jesus. Bless us and uh, unite us in spirit. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.